I'm Bob in Osterhout. Uh, I started teaching here at LCC in 1976. I uh, started teaching my current course, I think, in 1981 or 82, uh, Stress Management. It's, and I teach it just online now for the last few years because of some back problems. Um, I worked as a psychologist for almost 40 years, did counseling, and also worked with uh, a poverty program, facilitated program that was operated by people in poverty. And um, pretty much integrated that into my class and I was working on a project that uh, summarized what I had learned over the past 40 years um, since uh, 2012 when I retired from counseling because of problems with my back. And then the election happened last November. And before that, there was an election in, uh, in England, and I have a friend in London that I talk to on a regular basis, and I have a friend in Poland who talks about what's happening there and what's happening in Hungary and what's happening all over the world, really. And so I decided um, that I just needed to stop and rethink what I was doing and look at what direction our world was heading in and what was driving that and what could we do about it and could I offer anything to that. And fear-based thinking was the concept of fear-based thinking was, was kind of born out of that reflection. And I see it as, in many respects, the core of a lot of problems. Uh, very specifically, uh, for elections, it's something that's been increasingly used in the States, uh, started in the 60s, um, but it really uh, took on uh, a lot of headwind in the 90s. And, and it, it's really the, the go-to method for winning elections. And it's used all over the world now, the same consultants that, that got it started here are traveling all over. And, and getting other people elected with the same thing uh, because it works very well, okay? The bottom line is you don't ask questions when you're afraid, okay? And when you're stuck in fear-based thinking. Uh, but I realized as I looked at it that it's a much more complicated and deeper problem than just politics. Politics has used it as a, as a, as a tool um, and it's very, it's very effective for their purposes. The media uses it as well because fear will grab and hold our attention, okay? And that's what they want for, so they can uh, keep their advertisers happy. Um, but I realize that, that uh, fear-based thinking really is um, not just a temporary state. It isn't something that happens for a short time. And that's really the nature of fear. I, I've worked with problems with fear most of my life, and I really believe it, it underlies uh, just about every diagnosis that, that there is, um, and you can see, or you can see a component of it anyway. Uh, but fear-based thinking becomes a habit, and that's when it becomes dangerous. It's, uh, it gets structured into our brain. It gets structured into our way of thinking, and it affects how we view the world. It affects how we take in information, and it affects how we think. And I think it's particularly critical uh, for learning and for our students here because just based on experience and trying to think things through, younger people seem less stuck in fear-based thinking. They have more mental flexibility than someone who's been exposed to those messages for a long period of time and has kind of they've gotten settled in. And I'll explain how this works uh, a little bit down the road. Um, so it's really important, I think, to to get students to recognize that fear is something that can influence how they think and to give them some tools that they can use uh, to turn in another direction that's going to keep them learning and, and looking for solutions that, that have some lasting positive impact. So basically, fear-based thinking is a mental habit that persists after the messages of fear have passed. And the big problem with fear-based thinking is it stops us from asking questions. I worked with a man who had been in seclusion for 30 years. From the age of 12 until 42 when I met him, he had been locked in a single room by himself all the time. He'd actually been held in restraints in a straitjacket for almost three years continually. And this was in the 70s when uh, the state of Michigan came up with a new mental health code and that became illegal. They couldn't do that anymore, but they didn't know what to do with him. And the, the place where I was working had a small psychiatric unit, so they brought him up there for an evaluation. And I was asked to consult because I had a lot of experience calming people who had problems with violence. Um, so I spent an hour preparing myself to, to work with him so that I was in balance and, and, and could be open to what was going on with him. 
And in the process of bringing him into the building, where there were 700 staff uh, at the facility, and the director chose the biggest, strongest from all the units, four big, strong men, to bring him from, from his car to the room. And he was small. He was like this tall, maybe probably didn't weigh more than 120 pounds. There were a row of windows in the hallway at this height, and he put out three of them with his feet. So he was just high energy all out, all the time. So I opened the door and I stepped through and approached him like this. And this is the position I found worked with people with violence. It's interesting, interesting because the state of Michigan in their training taught us to go in like this. Oh, and that, great. yeah, come on, you want to fight? Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. So this worked because I can't strike a blow from this position. Okay, so people weren't afraid of me when I stood in this position. Also, my knees are bent, that's significant, I'll explain that later. And I'm breathing, you'll see my belly moving out if I'm not talking, okay. Uh, I'm breathing slow and deep in this position. So I'm in a relaxed state of mind. And I tried to get a sense of what it was like to be in his skin. What, who, who are you and, and what's happening with you right now? What's, what's going on? And he was pacing back and forth on the other end of the room, didn't pay any attention to me. And I got a sense that uh, it was pretty clear to me that, that he had an excruciating headache. I'd never seen that much tension in someone's face and head and neck before. It was like, Burr, just wow. Oh my God. So I picked up on that. So gee, I wonder if you've got a headache. Um, and no one knew if he had language. He'd never been evaluated. Okay? They didn't know if he was schizophrenic, if he was mentally impaired. They didn't know anything. Okay? Um, but I just you know, um, started picking up on that and said, you know, I, I've, I know something about tension. I've learned some things about that. And um, sometimes I can help people get rid of headaches. And if you want to sit down, I can give it a try. I don't know if it'll help. And he sat down on his bed. So that was the first time anyone knew that he understood English. Okay? And I worked on him, and it had no effect whatsoever. Um, and I sat next to him, and I talked for a while. And he never looked at me, just kind of kept his head down. And I couldn't think of anything else to say or do, so I just got up and walked out. And there was a whole crowd of people looking through the little window <laughs> in the room. And the nurse who had admitted him said, this never happens. He always attacks. It never happens. He always attacks. And there was a brand new staff person, a guy I'd never seen before. He was like 19. He had just finished his training. And he said, that's nothing. And he opened the door. He walked in, sat next to the guy. He was still on his bed and wasn't attacked. Okay? He put his finger exactly on what worked. Nothing. For 30 years, every human being he had contact with was stuck in fear-based thinking. They were expecting a fight. And they were prepared for it and ready for it. He picked up on that and attacked. Twice in one day, two guys walk in without fear, not thinking about that. OK, I knew how to protect myself. I knew I was closer to the door than he was to me. So I could let go of that okay? and focus on what he was doing rather than on protecting myself. And he doesn't attack. Okay? Fear-based thinking can keep us locked up. It can lock up our thinking so that we are unable to see what's really going on. Okay? Now, I'd like you to interrupt if you have questions. Um, we'll work it out in terms of the taping. Um, uh, Mortimer, Mortimer Adler once said that a lecture is the process of taking what's in the notes of the instructor and putting it in the notes of the students without passing through the mind of either. So I try to avoid lecture, but it is, I'm trying to get the information on tape too. So we'll try to find a, a balance there. So, but please, if something's not clear, uh, then I really appreciate the questions and, and we can get through the information, I think, in, in a lot of different ways. Yes? It's not that it's not clear, it's just that I want to hear more. Oh, okay. Um, you said you worked on him, but you didn't say what that meant. Oh, I just tried to relax his shoulders and his neck. Uh, but he didn't respond at all. Yeah, yeah. I just had learned some relaxation so things. Yeah, yeah. He was comfortable with that. Yeah, I, t I did it very slowly and and told him what I was going to do and and yeah, yeah. It's like it wasn't. Yeah, it's like yeah. No, no, no. It was tried to because I'd I'd worked with people to try to help them resolve headaches and it's pretty effective if you if the tension break up in your neck. You know that there's a whole pattern that that really feeds uh, headaches and actually I've got a, a video on my website. Um, on identifying patterns of tension and taking care of headaches. That's something that comes up in my class a lot. So I made a video of that for my online students. You're welcome to, to, uh, to you know, check that out and use it if it's helpful. So thank you. 
Okay. Now, just a moment, if you can talk to the person next to you, or if there's three of you, kind of put your heads together. Actually, there are groups of three, so that works out. Um, I'd like you to think of a time when you were afraid. Okay? Any time. Could have been childhood, could have been this afternoon. Okay? And how did it affect your body, your mind, your emotions? Just like you take maybe a minute, put your heads together, and just spontaneously what comes to mind without thinking too much about it. 